Lord Minto was, he was Governor General of India. So basically, the this act has been brought uh, with the recommendations and uh, acting support of these two people. Uh, these two people. So this act is more popular with uh, the name of these two people. <music> Good morning students, welcome back to Plutus IAS. So 95 days challenge, the first topic we are going to discuss is uh, constitutional developments in pre-independent India. So before adopting the constitution, there are sequence of acts that have been passed by British parliament to administer uh, Indian territories. So if we have to understand all those acts and their significance and impact on the constitution making of india okay so friends this is a, this is a very important area for uh, purpose of our examination there have been many questions in the prelims exam examination uh, from this uh, part so i hope you will find informative and useful information for the uh, prelims examination right so friends uh, before 1857 revolt Before 1857 revolt, whatever the acts that have been pa uh, passed by the Britishers, those are called charter acts because basically the charts, these acts have been passed to regulate the regulate the affairs of the East India Company. So because of that reason, these acts are being called as uh, charter acts. So these are a series of laws passed in. 18th and 19th century in 18th and 19th century to regulate the uh, East India's company, East India Company's territories in India. So the first act in the series of the acts is the Regulating Act of 1773. So the act basically has been made to regulate the affairs of the East India Company in India. So hence the name Regulating Act. So this is the first major intervention of the British Parliament in the administration of India, right? So uh, the East, in East India Company was basically a trading company, but uh, it acquired territory in India and it was overseeing admi administrative aspects also. So to uh, regulate those administrative access, uh, aspects, this act has been brought in. So what are the major change that was brought through this act is the Governor General of the Governor of Bengal was uh, made as Governor General. So Governor General of Bengal. So and also the Governor General's Council was formed to assist the Governor General in administration of the company. Right friends, uh, some of the reforms, economic and a political reforms have been introduced through this act. So basically, corruption was very much rampant in the East, East India Company. To address that aspect, some economic and political reforms have been brought in. The next act is Pitts India Act of 1784. So basically, the purpose of this act is to address the shortcomings of the Regulating Act of 1773. Right. So it was uh, named after the British Prime Minister William Pitt. So, as I've uh, already told, the ba basic purpose of this act is to address the shortcomings of the nine, uh, 1773 Act. So, two bodies have been established through this act. The first one is Board of Control and the second one is Court of Directors. So, the Board of Control is to uh, regulate the Political affairs, so companies, political affairs, uh, to regulate the political affairs of the East India Company, uh, the Board of Control has been brought in. And the Court of Directors, to regulate the economic affairs of the East India Company, the Court of Directors has been established. The third act in this series is Charter Act of 1793. So the major purposes of this act are renewal of the char charter. So basically, the East India Company 
the british parliament has granted uh trading rights for east india company uh, for basically first time for the 20 years and for every uh, every 20 years that charter has been uh, i mean updated and 20 more years have been granted to east india company so three uh, through this act an additional 20 years the company's East Indian uh, company has been renewed for 20 more years. Redefining Relations So it extended the Governor General of Bengal's authority to presidencies. Uh, those two president, other two presidencies were Madras Presidency and, and Bombay Presidency. So in this way, the Governor General of Bengal, his power, his authority has been further extended to uh, the Madras presidency, presidency and the Bombay presidency. Right. The other act is uh, Charter Act of 1813. So, major and substantial changes were brought in through this Charter Act of 1813. The first one is about missionary activities. So, for the first time in India, missionaries were allowed into Indian, British Indian territories. So they started influencing the people and started propagating uh, Christianity in India. Uh, next important point is renewal of charter. So companies uh, license to trade in India has been extended by further 20 more years. Right. One of the major important provision in this act is opening up of the trade. So now the trade with India, any British citizen can trade in India. Earlier, it was the monopoly of East India Company only. No one other than the East India Company uh, can do the trade in, uh, trade in India. Now, it has been open to all the subjects of British. Right. So, in this way, it ended the mono monopoly of East India Company in trade with India. However, there are two ex exceptions. One is uh, trade in tea. So, in this aspect, the monopoly of East India Company is still retained and trade with China. So, trade with China was very much uh, profitable. So, the East India Company managed to retain its monopoly in trade with China because uh, there was uh, Chinese people were uh, buying opium. So, this was very much profitable. East India Company was extracting lot of profits profits through uh, trade in opium so it managed to uh, retain its control over trade with china the next act is charter act of 1833 again the common point here is renewal of charter so east india companies license to trade in india has been extended by 20 more years right uh, the other important and significant point is abolition of trading activities so the trading activities uh, activities have been abolished. So basically, uh, why the trading acti activities have been abolished? Because time to time, time by time, as the time passes, the East India Company managed to capture a lot of Indian territories. So now it became more a political body than an economic, bo economic body. So to focus on the administration of these acquired uh, territories, uh, the trading aspect of East India Company has been uh, abolished. And the, from now on, the company focused on administering India. Right. The other act, aspect is centralization of power. So basically, the British are bringing more and more and last, and the power has been uh, being concentrated on the in the hands of the Governor General of Bengal. So in this way, kind of centralization is taking place taking place right right one more important point here is open competition for civil services now the indians can compete and enter into elite civil services right uh, earlier this was uh, the a system of patronage was there patronage means if the uh, the appointing authority whom he sees fit, he used to ad, uh, admit that person into civil services. Now that has been foregone and a merit system has been introduced to recruit people into 
civil services indian civil services right so after uh, the 1833 act is the last one in the uh, charter acts so as you all know the 1857 revolt has been taken place so since then a lot of changes have been uh, have come in the uh, administration of india the east india company stopped acquiring new territories and the same has been uh, reassured by the british parliament and also the indian territories directly came under the uh, control of the queen monarch british monarch the queen right so these acts were a series of acts par- passed by british parliament after 1857 revolt Pl- uh, uh, try to remember the difference in the na- uh, difference in the names first one are uh, charter acts now they are called as the government of india acts or the indian councils acts so uh, the import uh, these are some of the points about about the uh, these acts so first in this series of acts is uh, government of india act of 1858 so this has been brought immediately after the 1857 revolt uh, some of the important provisions uh, of this act are end of east india company rule so east india company uh, uh the company's rule, rule has been ended and the uh directly uh, india came directly under the com- control of british monarch so indirectly the citizens of india became the citizens of british right the second one is transfer of power so the responsibility of administration of india has been shifted to from east india company to british parliament right establishment of vice royalty so uh, when administering the princely states in de- uh, when dealing with the uh, princely states the governor general acted as vice roy of queen uh, or the british monarch right the other important thing that has taken place is expansion of legislative councils so uh, the legislative councils were expanded to include more official and non official members later we will understand what is meant by official members and non official members right another important point is introduction of uniform laws earlier uh, the british parliament used to make different laws for different regions for example uh, when the kent riots took place uh, a law came to address i mean particular to that region only the kent region only so in this way earlier laws were used to made only for a particular region now Uh, from now on the british ha- started making uniform laws for the entri- entire country entire territory that is under the control of the britishers right uh prelude to centralized administration as i uh, told the uh, power is increasingly being concentrated in the governor general more and more power shall be abroad and given to him to control india in a better way so the next important act is government of india act of 1861 so basically this act has been brought to address the shortcomings in the earlier act earlier act the government of india act of 1858 right so the important provisions in this act are introduction of legislative bo- bodies at the provinces so provinces you know there was uh, madras province there was bengal province etc so in those provinces i mean provinces means states in uh, today's understanding today's language language states so in the states also legislative bodies those are provinces uh, legislative uh, bodies have been introduced in provinces right increased indian representation so the existing legislative uh, bodies have been expanded to increase more and more indian people into those bodies still the majority of uh, official majority of official members have been retired official members means the britishers similarly the indian representatives indian representatives 
they are called non-official members. Right. So this is the basic uh, reference. Try to uh, remember this difference. Official members are British members. The non-official members are Indians. Right. The next act is the Councils Act of 1892. So this act has been basically brought to, uh, I mean, uh, fulfill some of the demands of the uh, Indians. As you all know, just before this act, Indian National Congress has been formed and is started. Uh, this is the moderate phase and they have started demand, uh, demanding some reforms in the administration and they were asking for including more and more Indians into the administration of the country. So to fulfill those demands, particularly this act has been brought in. So it is basically to increase Indian, increase the Indian representation in the administration of the country. So what happened in the, uh, through this act, increased provincial representation. So it, in, it increased the number of non-official members. That means Indian uh, membership has been increased in the provincial councils, provincial bodies. Right. And another important thing, thing is indirect election. So, for the first time in India, elections have been introduced. I mean, people electing their representative. So, for the first time in India, elections were introduced. So, the elections were not direct, indirect elections. So, basically, these elections were held to elect the non-official members. However, the electoral uh, electoral comprised of very small section of people. For example, those who are paying income tax and those who are in influential positions and those who are rich. So basically the electorate, electorate confined to only few sections of the Indian society. Right, folks? The next one is Indian Councils Act of uh, 1909. So basically uh, they are more popularly known as Morley Minto reforms. So Morley is, John Morley is the Secretary of State. Right, Secretary of State. Uh, Lord Minto was, he was Governor General of India. So basically, the this act has been brought uh, with the recommendations and uh, acting support of these two people. Uh, these two people. So this act is more popular with uh, the name of these two people. So the key provisions are separate electorates. So for the first time in India, the concept of separate electorates has come. So basically, the Muslims of India have been given the option of electing a separate representative. to represent only the Muslim community. So this is the basic concept behind, uh, behind this separate electorate. Friends, as we all know, this uh, separate electorate is actually led to the partition of India in 1947. So the seeds of basic, seeds of part partition basically have shown in this, uh, in this Indian Council's Act of 1909 or Morley Minto reforms. So uh, this is also the basic principle of British uh, principle of divide and rule. So in order to divide and rule the Indians, so they were following this principle and uh, the separate electorates uh, that has given is one of the major ele element in that policy. And the next one is increase the Indian representation uh, in the uh, legislative bodies for, uh, for Indians. It increased the number of elected members that uh, who were sent to this uh, legislative councils and also allowed indirect election for some more members, giving Indians a greater say in legislative affairs. Right. So this is a common point for what we have studied uh, the first point. Introduction of communal franchise. Communal franchise means uh, representation based on religion or community. So by uh, giving separate electorates to Muslims, the communal franchise has been introduced in India. I already uh, told this led to uh, partition of India. Right. 
right uh next we have the government of india act of 1919 so this is more popularly known as montague james ford reforms so montague was the secretary of state and uh james ford was the governor general of india so this was a significant milestone in the constitutional evolution of india right so some of the important provisions are diarchy in provinces so provinces means today's language states so what they have done is they have introduced a form of diarchy diarchy means dual government so they have introduced the concept of diarchy in provinces so the concept of diarchy here is basically the subjects at the state level they have divided into two parts the first one is transferred subjects and the next one is uh, reserved subjects so basically the subjects have been divided into transferred subjects and reserved subjects the transferred subjects means the subjects are the powers transferred to indians so the indian ministers non official members are indian ministers are responsible to administer this subjects and the reserved subjects are basically the powers are the powers are the subjects that are retained by the official members or the britishers friends basically the act has been brought in the background of home rule league movement all right so home rule uh, home rule league movement uh, self government has been uh, demanded through this rule so to fulfill those desires or the demands a, a semblance of self government has been brought in but uh, we can see in the future it is a uh, the diarchy at the provincial level is a disaster and it has to be withdrawn due to its dysfunctionality so what happened actually is the revenue generating uh, subjects or items they were retained with the britishers and the insignificant non important and the subjects which are included expenditure spending of money those have been uh, transferred to indian so the indians neither had have, have the powers or nor the resources to uh, implement the programs or to implement uh, the subjects that were transferred to them right so bicameral other uh, important uh, reform is bicameral legislature at the center bicameral means two bodies two houses all right so a two chamber legislature has been introduced at the central level at the uh, state national level so that is la- legislative uh, assembly this is uh, directly the people uh, who are representing here they are elected directly by the people And the second is second one is council of state so basically this body must represent in the interests of the states i mean provinces so a bicameralism present day we can say rajya sabha and lok sabha so lok sabha was a resemblance of legislative assembly and the council of state it was similar or equal to rajya sabha right extension of franchise as we have seen in the earlier acts the kind of election uh, i mean assemblance of election have been introduced introduced in india so that election franchise i mean the electorate that has been expanded by extending voting powers to voting rights to some other people some introducing some new criteria right it increased the number of voters by reducing property qualifications right so we have seen in 19 uh, not uh, 9 this uh, reform separate elections communal elections have been introduced so that communal representation has been further extended through this act so groups like sikhs christians and anglo indians they have also elected the option of, i mean given the option of electing a separate representative right so this is also part and parcel of the british principle of divide and rule india means the next important and most important in this series of acts is government of india act of 1935 so this is a major constitutional reform that significantly altered the governance structure in india 
So the major important points in this um, act are introduction of federal system at the national level. So it in introduced the federal system in India. Federal system means there will be two governments. So one is at the central level. The another is at the provincial level. So it introduced the system of federal system where uh, the government will be there at these two, stage, uh, two stages. One is at the central level, the other is at the provincial or state level. Right. Abol abolition of diarchy in provinces. Earlier in 1919 Act, we have seen diarchy has been introduced at the provincial level. So due to the dysfunctionality of that uh, diarchy with bad experience, it has been withdrawn. So the uh, diarchy has been withdrawn from the provincial level. So provincial autonomy. The states or the provinces, they have given the autonomy. So now they can have their own governments, they can legi own legislatures and they can have autonomy in administ administering the territory that is there in the particular province. So the provincial autonomy has been introduced at the province uh, through this 1935 Act. Uh, some other important provisions are extension of separate electorates as we have seen 1909 they have introduced 1919 they have extended here the separate electorate system it has been further ex extended to include depressed classes means scheduled caste so it is extended to depre depressed classes women and labor so actually Mahatma Gandhi vehemently opposed extending separate electorate to scheduled caste uh, because he believed that this system of separate electorate will split India into multiple pieces. So he vehemently opposed the separate electorate system, especially for granting this to scheduled caste, depressed classes. Right. So another important thing that has been taken place is abolition of Indian councils. So the Council of India, basically, which was assisting Indian administration from Britain, it has been abolished. And uh, a new India office, India office to see, oversee the affairs of India, this uh, office has been created, right. Emergency provisions. So basically, as we have seen, federal, a federal system has been formed. So a system of emergency provisions was introduced. Whenever uh, there is an emergency, the governor general will acquire all the powers and he will oversee the administration of provinces. So the governor general basically will assume more and more powers. So this is a very precautious system. Right. So in this way, there are a lot of important uh, provisions that are there in the 1935 Acts. And uh, the present constitution that was adopted in 1949 has a lot of, uh, I mean, basic administrative aspects. Those uh, all aspects have been taken from 1935 Act itself. So that's why we generally call uh, the present constitution as the uh, the blueprint for the present constitution has been basically taken from 1935 act so it is actually gives the framework or the structure for the present uh, constitution that we are having some uh, some experts also call it as the present constitution as the xerox copy of 1935 act though it was some exaggeration we can say Almost 70 to 75 percent of the basic principle, I mean, basic provisions that pertaining to administration, uh, administrative things like center state relations, the role of governor, the position of governor general, etc. So, all these basic principles, provisions have been taken from 1935 Act itself. So, just before, uh, uh, I mean, uh, to give independence in uh, independence to india a act has been uh, brought in the independence act of 1947 we will also look into the uh, important provisions in, in this act so with that we can conclude the pre cost uh, pre independence uh, constitutional developments in india what are all the acts that have been uh, brought in to administer india so some of the important provisions in this independent uh, independence act of 1947 are partition of india as we all know, the bitter result of independence is India has been divided into uh, two independent domains, that is India and Pakistan. So the 
undesirable result of national movement or the uh, independence movement is the partition of India into two independent dominions, India and Pakistan. Right. Independence. Independence has been granted to India and Pakistan, allowing them to become self-governing dominions within the British Commonwealth. However, it is up to India and Pakistan to become whether they want to stay in Commonwealth, they want to stay, join and stay in Commonwealth or not. So that is uh, up to India and Pakistan. All right. Abolition of Britain, uh, British sojournality, as we all know, the British has withdrew it, uh, its authority and given independence to uh, Indians and it transferred the power to hands of the Indian representatives. Right. The other important provision is transfer of power. So transfer has been uh, transfer uh, power has been transferred from British authorities to newly formed governments in India and Pakistan. So, so these acts between 1858 and 1945 represent a period of very significant development of constitutional provisions. Though there are a lot of shortfalls in these acts, these acts acted as a backbone or guiding principles for me for forming and adopting a new constitution that has been adopted in 1949. Right. So, uh, I think you have got some valuable and important uh, information through this discussion and I uh, hope you will utilize this uh, information in attempting your prelims questions in the examination. Right. Now we will see one MCQ from this topic which is asked uh, in previous examinations. Basically this question has been asked in 2012. So the question is, the distribution of powers between centre and states in the Indian constitution is based on scheme provided in which of the following acts. So the options are Morley Winter Reforms 1909, Montage uh, Sims uh, Act of 1919, Government uh, Government of India Act of 1935, Indian Independence Act of 1947. So the correct op option is option C, Government of India Act of 1935, because here the system of <coughs> federation has been introduced. So the cor uh, correct option is option C. Thank you friends. Thank you uh, for uh, joining the class. That's it for today. See you next time. Thank you.